there we go. Right, I've, incidentally, I've got the uh, the previous one has been recorded, and we will upload that to to uh, YouTube soon. Fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about another important thing um, that, that you need to consider when you're doing any modeling, um, and that is the concept of uh, distributions. So let's imagine for a moment that we wanted to build a model uh, of an emergency department triage process, and we know that patients are arriving on average, say, every five minutes. Now, we could tell the model to put a new patient into the system every five minutes. Seems reasonable. Uh, now, uh, let's imagine that we also know the time a patient takes to be on triage is also on average uh, every five minutes. So again, uh, we could tell the model to say uh, each patient will spend uh, five minutes uh, with the triage nurse. That all sounds uh, very reasonable, right? So let's just see what would happen uh, if that were to uh, pan out. So I'm just going to go back to the whiteboard. This is mainly because I've got a new toy. I've got a, um, a tablet recommended by Mike, which is excellent. Uh, so apologies, you are going to be subjected uh, to quite a lot of my uh, terrible scribblings uh, during, during this course. I apologies. So we've got uh, people coming in uh, and they're coming in every five minutes uh, and they get seen uh, by triage nurse. And that process also takes five minutes and then for the purposes of our system, they then leave. Um, now, we could model this as a fixed time estimate. So we say uh, every five minutes, patient comes in, they spend five minutes with the nurse. So let's imagine that our time started at uh, 9 a.m. So the first patient would arrive at 9 a.m. They would then spend uh, five minutes with the triage nurse. So they would finish in the system at 9.05 and then leave. The second patient, would arrive at 9.05 because we told them to arrive every five minutes. There's a five minute inter arrival here. And they would also spend five minutes with the nurse. Uh, and uh, so they would leave at 9.10, just as patient three is coming through the door, who also spends five minutes, leaves at 9.15, patient four then arrives at 9.15 and so on. Now, this all sounds great, but the, we all know that that's not realistic. Because that, if we were to model that, uh, our system would say there is no queue, nobody ever waits. The triage nurse is probably looking a little flustered, uh, having a constant stream of activity and no break. Um, but nonetheless, it doesn't seem very realistic. And that's because the thing we haven't accounted for is variability. Because of course, patients may well arrive uh, every five minutes on average and may well uh, take uh, five minutes to be triaged on average. But as we discussed earlier with the first example, that doesn't mean that all patients arrive five minutes on the dot and spend exactly five minutes uh, with the triage nurse. So let's look what would happen if we deal with this in terms of averages. So let's say the first patient still arrives at nine. They spend five minutes with the triage nurse. That's all fine, okay. But let's say that the, uh, because it's only an average, the next patient may actually arrive at 9.04, which means they have a one minute wait before the nurse is free at 9.05 to then see them. So then they're seen at 9.05. Uh, and uh, let's say they spend six minutes uh, with the nurse. So then they're finished with the nurse at 9.11. Meanwhile, another patient has come in, let's say this one did arrive five minutes after this one at 9.09. .09. They've now got a two minute wait because this patient who arrived at 9.04 waited for a minute and then spent six minutes with the nurse. So now we've got a two minute wait here. Uh, so uh, meanwhile, this patient may also arrive at 9.10. Suddenly we've got a couple of them. Now this patient who was waiting for, uh, arrived at 9.09, they've got a two minute wait till 9.11. Let's say they, they only spent um, four minutes with the nurse. So they come out at 9.15. Uh, this patient down here, has now got a five minute wait before they can even be seen, which means if anybody comes in in that five minutes, they're also gonna have a wait. So already just within a few patients and within a little bit of variability, just one minute either side, um, 
we can see that already queues are starting to form and that shouldn't come as a great surprise to us because you know we're, we're all whether we work in healthcare or not um we can we we've all observed queues we've been in those queues uh, we know that people uh, don't arrive five minutes uh, in exact five minute intervals and we know that the triage nurse doesn't look at a watch at 905 and say right get out now um because i i've, I've gone to my uh, five minute allocation now there are some systems of course where that may well be the case where where you do have fixed times but certainly for something like this that wouldn't seem uh, an appropriate way to do things and so we need it's really important that we capture um, this concept of uh, variability so let's go back to the slides so the way in which we capture variability within the system is using something called uh, distributions now distributions are essentially ways to emulate variability within the real world data that we see and it does this by essentially providing us with an estimate of the probability of a certain value occurring in the future so we can use a distribution to say well when we look at the past data yeah sure on average uh, patients spend five minutes with a triage nurse but you know 30% uh, of them actually spend seven minutes with the nurse and 20% uh, of them uh, spend eight minutes with the nurse and you know what we've got five percent of them who spend 15 minutes with the nurse and so that's really important uh, to make sure that we're capturing all that and distributions allow us to do that because it allows us to create a probability distribution that, that allows us to map the uh, the uh, value in terms of uh, uh, any, either an interarrival time or a time, a process time, i.e. the time you spend with the nurse or in a particular activity uh, against the probability. And when we're modelling, that's really important because then when we plug that into the model, rather than saying patients come in every five minutes and spend five minutes with the nurse, we can say sample randomly from this distribution, which has an average of five minutes, but I want you to randomly determine how long this patient is going to spend uh, with the nurse uh, and so it might choose that this patient it'll have a say a 30 percent uh, chance that this patient will spend uh, seven minutes with the nurse or six minutes with the nurse or whatever it might be so it's a way for us to be able to capture that variability now there are lots of um what are called named distributions available these are distributions that have certain shapes and uh, characteristics um, and you will find that most of your data real world data will fit one of these particular uh, distributions and each distribution uh, is defined by zero to many parameters so some distributions have no input parameters whatsoever others uh, we specify things like for example the mean and that then specifies the size and shape of that distribution so here are some um, common distributions that you might work with I'm not going to go into detail uh, about them now uh, except to say that um, the there are a few that you probably won't want to be using much um, and some that you will be using a lot so particularly exponential and log normal distributions you will find you will use quite a lot within your modeling because they're actually pretty good fits for inter-arrival times and for process times in real world data um, so they're they're your go-to distributions for this kind of modeling work um, the, there is a uh, distribution called the uniform distribution the uniform distribution just basically says uh, every value has an equal chance of being uh, selected. So if I said, you know, give me a number between one and 10 at random, uh, that would follow a, norm, uh, a uniform distribution because it basically is a random uh, equal chance of you saying um, any particular number. That distribution isn't so useful for uh, capturing the real world variability, but it is tremendously useful when we come to actually do some modeling because it allows us to sample a random number which then determines what things might happen and we'll get more into that when we talk in in terms of the um, both the the Python training um, which will be starting next week um, and, and particularly when we get into the discrete event simulation training uh, there is also a distribution called the triangular distribution um, I, I, I hate the triangular distribution with a passion um, it might be useful arguably when your data is extremely limited but what it basically does is it says What's the lowest value you'd expect to see? What's the highest value you'd expect to see? Um, and uh, it, it creates a, uh, and, and what's the typical value you might expect to see? And then creates a triangle around that. Um, it can be useful, 
possibly if you've got nothing better. Um, but generally speaking, I would still uh, then default to um, exponential and log normal distributions, which are common uh, for this kind of thing, and plug in the, the data you've got. So that's distributions. You'll get a chance to play around with distributions uh, a little bit on Tuesday. Uh, and then when we start doing modeling in earnest, uh, you'll have um, uh, much more practice on that. Um, any questions about distributions or anything we covered so far? Anything there, Sean? Nothing at the moment, Dan. Excellent. Everybody seems you. happy. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I, 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 I will take silence as happiness. That, that's good. Okay. So um, something I touched on earlier was um, the, I, I kept mentioning about validating and verifying. Validation and verification are two very important concepts uh, within modeling. Uh, and they're very different. And you'll probably forget which one's which. I know I do all the time. Uh, and I usually refer back to this slide. Uh, so uh, hopefully you, you, you will do so as well. There are two different types of um, ways in which you might want to validate or verify things. So validation is basically the process of determining whether a model is sufficiently accurate for the particular objectives of the study. Is it a valid model? Is the model that I've designed and created uh, of my emergency department, is that a good enough representation of my real world? Have I made the right kinds of decisions? Am I emulating the right kinds of things? Have I included uh, the right kind of stuff? Is my scope right? Is my detail right? Is, is this a good representation for the purposes, uh, albeit you know, a simplified representation, but the purposes of answering my question? Now that's slightly different to verification. Verification basically says, when I turn my design for a model, into my mathematical model or my computer program, whatever it might be, have I made any errors? So I may have uh, in my design said, okay, I'm gonna model um, uh, uh, patients spending uh, an average of five minutes as a triage nurse and that'll follow an exponential distribution. But then I need to check that that's what I've done in my actual model and that process of verification. So if I then accidentally put in a normal distribution, uh, uh, I've coded something incorrectly in my model, that, that in verifying that I would hopefully uh, pick that up. So that's a slightly different thing to validation. Validation is checking your, uh, your model against that kind of real world and seeing is that a good enough uh, emulation for uh, the real world problem I'm trying to capture. And verification is, you know, have I made any silly mistakes in trying to translate that design for model, conceptual model into my mathematical computer model, whatever it may be. So um, going, thinking of validation, um, there are some uh, really simple uh, ways in which we can think about how we might declare a model as being valid. Now one simple approach is something known as black box validation and that's basically where we say well do you know what I made this model of my uh, GP surgery for example um, and I ran the model and I compared the results um, for uh, waiting times over a month and it seemed a pretty good match for what's happening um, in the real world. And that's one way to validate. And there's nothing essentially wrong with that as part of a validation process. But there are potential problems with that. One of the uh, most significant problems is that it ignores uh, the internal workings of the model. You may well get the same results completely by chance. Uh, and, and actually, your, the internals of your model are, are not correct. They are not set up um, so that if you applied this to something else, you may find your, the results are not um, valid at all. Also, it's all very well comparing against uh, what's happening now. How are you going to validate against the what if scenario? That scenario doesn't exist in the real world. That's why you've built the model. So how are you going to compare against something that doesn't exist in the real world yet? Also, often real world data is just not available to validate against or is in itself inaccurate. So it's not the best benchmark for validation. So black box validation is a good start and it's something you, you typically want to do, but it's not enough on its own. We also need to think about other ways in which you might want to validate. That might be uh, taking smaller parts of the model and validating those. Let's, let's take the, the triage process in, in RED, for example. Let's validate that and see, is that capturing uh, the, 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 the triage process we're seeing in the real world? 
looking at the input data uh, and making sure uh, that's valid, comparing it with the, the experts, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and trying to see um, whether the data that you're putting in is solid uh, and is this representative? Does this feel right to the people who are actually in this system? And also comparing uh, results to, to uh, similar models, sometimes simpler models, and also thinking about how you might assess un uncertainty. And so at the end of this morning session, I'm going to um, uh, uh, show you a, um, a YouTube video on our YouTube playlist um, that I want you to watch in your own time, uh, all about sensitivity analysis. Um, and that's a really good way in which we can test to see um, how problematic it might be um, if we are um, slightly wrong in terms of our assumptions and simplifications. So I'll talk more about that in a bit. It's also important to change our thinking a little bit about some of this as well. So one of the fundamental things to remember is it's not possible to prove that a model is valid, but you can disprove that it is valid. You can demonstrate that this is not a valid model because this is wrong. Okay, so the way in which you should think about validation is as a process of trying to build confidence that the the thing you've built is good enough for the purpose uh, for which it was built. So, uh, does it sufficiently address the question? Does it sufficiently capture the aspects of the system, uh, albeit in a simplified way, in order for us to get gain some insight, some evidence? in order to make our decision. Remember, that's why we're building the model in the first place. Now, of course, confidence thresholds uh, vary enormously uh, between uh, both users and models and between users and modelers. Um, and so it means that you may have a model that is perfectly valid, but is not viewed as credible. They don't believe that that's a really good model. They think, well, you didn't include this. And that's, I think that's really important. It may be that it's not important, but they may then not uh, have confidence uh, it, it, uh, that your model is a credible model. Um, it also means, of course, vice versa, that you may have a model that's a load of rubbish, but it may be viewed as credible because it says all the right things. And that's a real issue when you come to do any modeling, particularly where very often when you're being asked to do a, a model, um, you will, you're being asked because somebody has a feeling that something is wrong and they feel that this solution may be the way forward. If your model says that it is the way forward, they are far less likely to question it because it says what they want to hear. And that's just human nature. So you need to be really careful as a, as a modeler to make sure that you're being as objective as possible and as critical as possible of, of your model. And also, if you're using another person's model, that you're asking the right kinds of questions. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that a valid model is the most realistic one. We've talked about that at length today already. Okay, any questions about uh, any of that? No? Nothing on the chat at the moment. Fantastic, excellent. Okay, so um, that was kind of a whistle-stop tour of um, operational research. Now, um, traditionally, uh, operational research has been the bread and butter of what we do. It's, it's the OR in our name. Um, and operational research has um, a long and successful history in, uh, in industry such as um, manufacturing, uh, etc. Um, it's, it's had less of a, a, a storied history in, um, in the health service. That's changed a lot, particularly in the last 10 years, I think. Um, and certainly something we've been working to change uh, within our team that's that's exactly why we exist um but it is a really powerful tool it's not without its uh, uh sort of a really powerful uh, set of methods it's not without its uh, uh flaws as an approach um but it's really useful in being able to try and provide evidence uh, to decision makers it absolutely should not be the uh the determiner the sole determiner of a decision uh you shouldn't be making decisions based on well the model says this so i'm going to do it it should feed into that decision making process and be part of that evidence that's considered alongside other things. A really good example of that, we, we've done lots of geographic modeling in the past and we've had situations where, you know, our model says, do you know what, the, the best place to put this service 
according to the model in terms of minimizing uh, travel times for patients and staff is here and the decision makers quite rightly say the model may say that but we also know that that facility there has a very small capacity so if we're going to start sending loads of people there we've then got to make a decision as to whether we then invest lots of money into that service um, and you know all the the real world issues that entails improving the car parking building uh, extra space to house all these people um, or do we look at a slightly suboptimal decision according to the model but which we know is far better set up to deal with what we want to do uh, so modeling should always only be part of that that jigsaw puzzle in recent years um we particularly over the last year or so um pencord has, has much more branched into the field of uh, data science as well um and data science is a little bit different to operational research although very often these things uh, go hand in hand so data science basically uses methods from things like machine learning uh, statistics data mining data analysis uh, in order to generate insight from data so in operational research as we've seen this morning we start with a system or process um, and we grab some data about that process and we use that to plug it into a model uh, to emulate that system so we create a little virtual version of our ed or our gp surgery or whatever it may be in the computer so we can then play around with it and then see what might happen and then we can feed those results back in data science we don't start with the system we start with the data and we use various techniques in order to try and look for hidden patterns and hidden structures in that data that can provide us with insight with new information so we're exploring that data the data itself rather than using the data uh, as a something to plug into um, uh, into our model of a system for example so here's an example of operational research question we want to make these changes to our process for triaging patients what do we predict the impact will be uh, and what resources are we going to need to ensure the process is efficient that's a typical standard OR question whereas a data science question might be something like you know what we've got lots of data on readmissions can we teach a machine to try and automatically identify which patients are likely to be readmitted and you see the subtle difference there it's, it's all about exploring the data to see if we can tease things out of the data rather than trying to model a real world process uh, and using the data to plug into that process uh, so within pencord as say we've been very much branching into a lot of data science methods over the last few years certainly when we first ran uh, the pilot HMA program in 2016 we didn't do any of this uh, we weren't even using free and open source software uh, at that point so a lot of has changed over the last four years um, but a predominant focus within both Pencord and the wider data science community is uh, the field of artificial intelligence um, and AI is such a big thing now um, uh, and uh, likely something you, you, you've kind of uh, seen all around you as well and specifically within our uh, within our team we focus on uh, machine learning, including uh, deep reinforcement learning, which, um, as Mike said earlier, uh, um, Mike uh, has a particular interest in uh, machine learning, reinforcement learning, and we'll be taking you through some really exciting stuff uh, in that field. Um, and the other side of it is we look at um, AI based uh, natural language processing, which is my particular interest, which is where we say, uh, I've got all this free text data. Um, I, I, I want to extract some information from that and it might be that I want to um, ident maybe I've got some reviews of patient from patient surveys and I want to classify them automatically into positive and negative reviews or it might be that I need to I've got all this information and I want to automatically pick out um, things called named entities so I want to pick out you know the people that are mentioned the um, the places that are mentioned, the, the procedures that are mentioned, because I need to work with that analytically. We also special, specialize in, in um, uh, some other data science techniques, um, network analysis and R in particular. So these, this is, uh, uh, both of those are Sean's area. Um, so uh, Sean does some fantastic stuff around um, network analysis, um, looking at the, uh, the links between various elements within a system. Uh, and also the use of R and it's interesting the 
I, I know a number of you have, have some limited experience uh, in programming in R, and there has been very much a push for R um, uh, from the, uh, within the NHS. Um, and so um, you really using R as a, as a, a great way to do uh, modern analytics. So we're going to teach you about all of these things and much more uh, within, uh, within the course. But here's just a sort of brief uh, whistle top um, uh, with stop tour. So machine learning, ultimate aim of machine learning is to get a machine to learn and improve from data. And there are two, uh, sorry, three broad types of um, uh, uh, machine learning. There's supervised learning. Supervised learning is essentially where we get a machine to learn and it's guided by feedback that it gets from examples. So we give it lots of training examples and we say, um, Let's say uh, we're trying to get it to detect uh, cancer based on um, uh, various uh, metrics, um, various uh, patient observations. We can say we've got all of this data which shows that um, uh, these patients had cancer and these patients didn't have cancer. Um, and we try to get the machine to learn. So can you find the things in there that, that pick up whether that patient has cancer, that patient doesn't have cancer, such that when it's given new information, it can try and make those predictions. It's found something that perhaps we can't see that's, uh, that's within there. And um, a great example of that is um, uh, Mike, I'm sure, will talk about in his sessions about uh, get, uh, how pigeons have been trained to identify cancer. Absolutely true story. Um, and uh, I'm sure Mike will talk about that more in, in, uh, in his training. The other side of that coin is something called unsupervised learning. That's where we don't have correct examples to show the machine. Very often that's because we don't know what the answers are. So instead, it's a slightly different problem. We're here, we're getting the machine to look for hidden patterns and structures to try and organize the data in some way. So it might be that we're, we want to um, separate it out into various groups. Uh, so something in natural language process, processing, which we don't cover in this course, um, uh, called topic modeling, which is why you, where you try and um, uh, separate uh, texts into various groups. Um, that's an example of unsupervised learning. It's looking for things that, where it thinks the, there are similarities and grouping similar things together. Uh, and one of the newer um, uh, emerging um, areas of AI, here, looking around reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is essentially where you have agents who are interacting with an environment in some way, and they're using trial and error to do that. And each time they interact, with their environment, it provides some signal uh, to the agent, which either rewards or punishes, which, or, or the absence of reward, which is in itself a punishment um, uh, to the agent. And essentially that the agent then gradually learns to undertake actions that lead to reward. Reinforcement learning is used extensively in ecological modeling because animals, when they're foraging, for example, uh, use reinforcement learning. That's a known uh, uh, way in which they learn where there is food. Um, uh, bee uh, foraging, for example, they, they learn where the best uh, flowers are that contain the, 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 the nectar that they need and where, where they should go. And if they, if they run into runs of bad luck in terms of not being able to get food, they learn from that. So reinforcement learning is, is really useful. And Mike's got some fantastic um, projects on the go at the moment, trying to use exactly those kinds of concepts to see if we can uh, train a machine to, to uh, better run a hospital. So um, interesting stuff to look out for in that. As I mentioned, um, I'll be taking you through natural language processing where we're trying to extract in, insight and information from free text, uh, commonly either identifying sentiment, named entities, uh, sometimes relationships between entities, and common themes and topics. And sometimes we want to do those things together. So it might be, you know what, I've got this patient survey data. Can I get an AI to uh, look through that survey data? Not only tell me which ones were positive and which ones are negative without having to get somebody to sit down and read through all these thousands of surveys, but also those that were positive and those that were negative, can, can I get the AI to actually pick out the things they were talking about? You know, what, when they talked positively, were they talking about the, the food that they had at the canteen, for example? When they talked negatively, were they talking about the weight for the, for the pharmacy? So um, it allows us to really extract automatically that, that kind of uh, in-depth information. We've got lots of uh, training lined up for you around natural language processing. Uh, I know you'll all be very familiar with uh, free text data in, in your roles.
network analysis um, I'd say this is where you're attempting to model and visualize the relationships between entities in a system or process um, that can help you to really unpick uh, complexities within a, within a system so Sean's done a lot of work in uh, a, applying this really successfully to mental health systems where there's some really complex systems and interplays at work and using the, these kind of techniques we can get real insight into how things are working in these complex systems and really help us understand what what might need to improve and finally in R um, as I say R a number of you will be familiar uh, with R now, um, but R is essentially a statistical programming language um, that is fast growing in, in popularity and currently being pushed hard uh, within the NHS. Um, it's a really powerful way um, to be able to do that kind of stuff that you guys have probably traditionally done in Excel. And I, I speak on behalf of the entire PenCord team now uh, when I say this message if you take nothing else from this uh, training program take this away and 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 relay it to your managers and, and hopefully your your training here will help demonstrate this excel is a spreadsheet software package and unless you're undertaking some kind of financial calculation wizardry you should step away from excel excel is not made for modeling excel is not made for the kind of analysis that's often it's often useful and there are better ways and, and now with the uh, barrier to entry coming right down, methods such as R and, and Python as well allow you to be able to do those kind of things that you've had to do traditionally in Excel in a much more powerful um, and efficient language. Um, so that, that's, that's my, uh, I'll step off my soapbox now. Okay, so uh, enough, yeah. enough from me, sorry. Um, sorry, just before we answer the exercise of that, uh, we've got a few questions that popped up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so one from Tom. Um, have your thoughts about model credibility as well as the impact that the agendas of both modelers and users has significantly changed following the pandemic? So I think this is um, so about model credibility and kind of people's different agendas. In, impacting on what they're wanting from the model or what they're trying to see and whether kind of the pandemics kind of changed how you assess credibility yeah that's a really interesting question actually um so um so in my personal experience so the the, the modeling that i've been doing since the beginning of the pandemic has revolved mainly around um end of life care um and that's not something i've experienced in that um However, what I will say is something that, that is, has, I, I will say, I think the one key thing that has changed, which I think is very positive, is that uh, the profile of modeling as a thing um, has gone through the roof because of the pandemic. Um, because, uh, you know, we are all exposed to the 24 hour news stories of the, you know, the, 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 the sage advisors have built a model and it's predicting that people, there are people now, um, you know, I, I feel if I explain what I do now, more people will understand it because actually the, the, the profile of modeling has risen considerably. Um, I think and the, just to check in there, actually, um, yes. I think one of the things, cause we were trying to credit check um, Neil Ferguson's models Mm. when they first came out um, and actually the thing that we were quite surprised about was how old they were <laughs> yes yes um, and also trying to actually get hold of the model code uh, took a while um, yeah. and and then yeah the, the were issues were raised <laughs> within that the nice thing was though that people were making their models available and that it was about everybody credit you know checking them and trying to verify and uh, validate as far as possible those models yeah. so there's a mo lot more of that open working yeah absolutely i i would agree with that and i think that's that's a that's been really nice to see and you know it's something that we will be pushing for uh we, we push for uh within the group and that we push for within the hsma training is this idea of free and open source uh not just in terms of it's great to be able to teach you software that you don't have to pay for, which is, of course, a benefit. Of course, that is. But do you know what the real benefit for us uh, as academics and hopefully for you as modelers and members of the NHS and police forces 
you you're able to then share and, and and benefit from things being shared and this sort of stuff should be shared you know we should be this this is a pandemic that's affected everyone in the world um and actually this has really brought home the idea of if people are developing this kind of stuff make it open put stuff out there so the the model i've uh, developed for the end of life care for example is completely free and open source anybody can go online and access that model they can build on that model they can further develop it they can use it however they like and that's really important i think so that yeah i think that's a really good point sean actually about the free and open sources and it has been nice to see much more of that i think in the in the pandemic certainly from what i've seen yeah oh great and uh okay uh, a question from greg here um where there are further considerations for example like a, a kind of best sites best practice example model would you try and build all of that into a model or would you make a second model to build the results into or leave it to decision makers to apply their professional knowledge so i think this is talking about um where you've got a base case then your what if testing mm -hmm. but perhaps you want to compare to another site or another example yeah um and and perhaps how uh, i suppose this is looking at um the way that we structure models and having you know, I suppose from my experience, it's, it's often mo multiple examples of a model. Uh, yes. Um, as, as you make changes, you wouldn't try to do it all within one model. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, um, yeah, so it, it's, uh, the, the, the key thing I'd reiterate here is that your, your, so your base case should always represent what is happening now, and wh whether that's good or bad. Um, your, how you then approach um, testing against various different scenarios will differ. So if you did want a sort of, um, you know, the, the benchmark approach, it may be for your particular model, that's considered as a what if question. You say, well, what if, what if we were doing this? What if we were seeing this amount of patients and we were doing, doing it this way and, and, and using that as a what if question? But it might be that your what if question is much more uh, a, a kind of structural thing. It's, it's, you know, the what if things were completely different and, and, and it was like this, in which case you may necessarily want to create a separate model. So I, I think it very much depends on the context of the problem um, and is a decision that you would make uh, as a modeler. And that's part of how you would think about your, your conceptual model, um, your design for your model or models, um, how you're essentially translating both the real world in terms of what's actually happening now and the scenarios that you want to compare against, whether that's your sort of your standard what if questions or even a, a sort of benchmark, um, how how you would go about sort of then designing that. But I, there's no single right answer to that, I guess, uh, is what I'm saying. But you're certainly yeah. the, the the one standard thing is you your base case should always be what is actually happening, but warts and all. That that that's yeah. very important. But yeah, I suppose in terms of experimental testing. Um, it's always really important just to say that uh, when you change something in the model, you test one change, testing, you, you test one change, then you test another change um, and, and another change. But testing, you wouldn't test changes in combination until you test changes individually yes. to understand what their impacts are and then you change in combination. Um, so there's that kind of more... Uh, systematic experimental approach to it as well so you wouldn't just throw yeah. everything in to look at what it happens if we change everything yeah, yeah. absolutely and, and that's by the way also good advice for any real world changes you should yeah. but it, it happens all the time people do that they change everything but then they have no idea what's worked what hasn't um so then if something goes wrong how do you know what worked uh, yeah. and what went wrong so yeah really good advice yeah. um just, uh, a quick one here um unsupervised learning has uh do we know of any examples where this has been used in early covid research Ooh, good question i think perhaps, I, i'm, I'm uh, going to defer to mike as our machine learning expert mike are you aware of anything unsupervised learning oh no, there must be some clustering work that that has been been done using unsupervised learning but i can't i haven't seen anything specific no yeah, I, no, I'm just trying to think if there was, yeah, you could have, maybe something in natural language process. I've not seen anything, but you could imagine, you know, trying to, because uh, one of the things about, you know, 
pandemic research is that you've got you know some people that are you know, doing the clinical research you've got some people that are doing uh, the service type research which is where we fit in but also you've got people who are trying to sift through the evidence and so uh, actually having automated ways to try and classify things and group things up can be really useful so i can imagine i, I expect something like that has been done but i i don't know yeah 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 potentially on yeah looking at clusters um of uh, uh people um uh just sorry just super matthew blythe is the r rate count not unsupervised no no the r rate calculation is, is, is a mathematical um calculation not a machine learning approach yes yes um you'll, you'll nice learn a bit about from, agent so. <laughs> um a nice comment for Vic Thomas, just saying uh, this would be great not to use Excel. Good to see what else to, can be used. Fantastic. Great. Yes, um, more of that. <laughs> and from Adam... Uninstall it. Uninstall it. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> and from Adam, is the GPT-3 OpenAI um, an example of natural language processing? Uh, <laughs> and no, in that it's there's natural language processing in it, but it's it's a lot bigger than that as well. As you know, if people have come across GPT-3, it's an agent that you talk to and it will give responses. It can do rudimentary maths because it's learnt that. But I think it would go beyond what you would normally call as natural language processing, but it would include natural language processing. Yeah, it's, it's something so something we touch on uh, at the very start of the natural language processing course is that there are two sides to natural language processing. Um, there's the, um, the side that we'll talk about, which is basically trying to uh, use typically AI based methods to try and uh, get insight from data to extract information. There's also the stuff that I did when I was at uni, um, which is where you're using natural language processing to try and get machines that you can talk to and which give the appearance they're understanding you. Uh, and that's where you get into the joys of things like, I, I, I first learned what a morpheme was there, which is uh, like a syllable, but a semantic syllable. Um, and some people may find that very interesting. Um, I, I kind of do, but, it, but it's, it's very different to, to the, the kind of thing we do. So yeah, there is that kind of side of natural language processing where you're get it, building machines that can, you can try and have conversations with. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, we don't cover that in, in this. Great. Was there anything else? Okay, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, oh, but Python has embraced Excel with the Excel Wings library. Oh, delete enough, it enough. now. <laughs> 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 yeah. We'll show, yeah. We'll, we'll show you how you how, how you don't even need to worry about that. It's, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just but, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Great questions. Keep them coming. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Please, please do. Okay, so I think what we'll do, because I'm conscious that it's um, uh, just under 15 minutes to lunch, but I'd still like to do this little exercise, uh, but I won't ask you all to come back after. Um, so what we're going to do, I, what I want you to do in your peer support groups, I want you to have a chat on Slack about um, some potential applications that you can see uh, for data science in your organisation. So things like machine learning and natural language processing and network analysis um, uh, uh, and the use of R for analytics. Can you, what sort of examples can you think of, even at this early stage, for where this might be useful? Now, we're not expecting you to know much about these things, obviously, um, at this stage, but just have a, a chat within your within your groups. Um, and um, uh, certainly then, if there are any sort of uh, interesting things you'd like to share with the rest of the group, put it in one of the, uh, the open channels, maybe on the um, HSMA Plaza. Feel free to chat there um, over lunch, as well. The Plaza is a really good place just for sort of general HSMA uh, chit chat uh, but do make sure uh, that you do take a lunch break in 10-12 uh, minutes um, there's also some further work to do um, which I'd advise you do, uh, don't do this yet um, maybe look at it um, in your own time over the over the coming days but do watch the bonus tutorial that's on the uh, HSMA YouTube channel um, called sensitivity analysis um, it's a very short I think it's 10-15 minute video I've recorded um, which will just talk to you about uh, sensitivity analysis and why that's a really important uh, concept when you're uh, testing your models and um, particularly thinking in terms of um, it basically shows I, I love sensitivity, uh, sensitivity analysis because it basically says I'm probably wrong but does it matter 
that's what sensitive analysis is. If, if I'm wrong, how much of a problem is it? Um, and it's a really nice way to, to bounce off questions because you can say, yeah, I know I've probably got that wrong, but do you know what, I've, I've done this analysis and it says even if I'm wrong quite a bit, it's not gonna change the results too much. So it's a really nice thing. So do check out that video, have a chat over the next 10, 12 minutes within your groups, uh, but then do make sure uh, that you stretch your legs and get something to eat um, before this afternoon session where we're gonna be talking all about uh, programming, uh, fundamentals of programming. We're not going to be doing any coding hands-on today, uh, but we are going to get you to have a look um, at a, uh, a new shower system that I that I've uh, come up with. So, uh, all exciting stuff to come. Uh, any questions? If you want to contact us as a uh, 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 chat in Slack, and we will see you back here at one thirty. See you, everyone.